And I'm happy to introduce a good friend of the museum, as well as a staunch advocate of biodiversity conservation and education, Ms. Nikki Dayan Rea Lubit. Uh, Nikki Dayan, or Nick Dai, is currently a graduate student in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Kansas in USA. Nikki graduated with a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, after which she pursued her master's degree in wildlife studies at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. And during those years, Nikki was involved in various projects, serving as a research assistant for the ecology and conservation of parrots in the island of Luzon to analyzing the gut contents of small non-volant uh, rodents in Mount Banahaw. More recently, um, Nikki was the project leader for establishing the ecological information on the McGregor Spit Viper in Batanes Islands, a project coordinator for bird survey methods training in Tawi-Tawi, a high school biology teacher at the Holistic Education and Development Center in Taytay Rizal, and a proud exacting mentor to students in and out of academe. Currently, she, most, uh, she spends most of her time learning scientific illustration, uh, studying molecular analysis tools, troubleshooting her extractions and PCRs, and engaging on philosophical discussions on the role of museums in society. Everybody, let us all welcome Ms. Nikki Diane Realubi. Nikki? Thank you very much, Sir Flor, for that wonderful introduction. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to everyone in the Philippines. Good evening to this from my side of the world and a range of good morning, good afternoon, good night, good midnight to everyone that has uh, that is around the world watching this. I am delighted to be given this opportunity to give this presentation to the UPLB Museum of Natural History seminar talks. I've always wanted to do this and now I'm doing it. And let's see how far the, the chill factor goes when I'm presenting. So what I will be presenting is how I entitled it as DNA Barcoding Plus, wherein me, and you will go through a journey to unravel Philippine biodiversity with next generation sequencing. As Flor, Sir Flor said, I'm a graduate student, so I'm not going to take the position of being a professor lecturing to my audience, the students, but it is um, uh, up to every one of us to make this uh, interaction worthwhile. And aside from um, the university, of Kansas, where I'm a student right now. I am also a founder, founding member of Buhay Ilang Research, Education, and Conservation Incorporated. So for this presentation, eh, I will not be showing you my specific study specifically and tell you what, what is my intro, my methods, my results in discussion, but I took a different tack in making this presentation. And my presentation goals would be uh, two-pronged, which is to raise awareness and provide a glimmer of understanding, all in all in the service of anyone who is a participant, who is listening and not just, uh, who is listening as an audience right now, would be able to maybe write a capsule proposal for um, if not next generation sequencing, at the very least DNA barcoding or Sanger sequencing. Um, specifically, I would like to raise awareness um, on DNA barcoding and the status quo of Philippine biodiversity in relation to that specific method. And I would like to differentiate between the sequencing te technology, um, Sanger sequencing and net next generation sequencing in particular, and how they've been used so far um, using Philippine taxa. And basically, I would like to provide a glimmer. And when I say a glimmer, just a little bit of spark because I don't have enough time to really hammer in, really hammer in, there you go, one moment there, to really hammer in 
um, a thorough understanding of these molecular tools. But I would like to at least share to you what could be possible hypothesis that we could test using these molecular tools. And my favorite part of this talk would be um, to convince you to join me in building a global village um, to foster collaborations, to construct pipelines. Um, I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna go and discuss that later. Uh, and because this is a presentation that I would like to have feedback on, uh, I would like you to shoot me an email at nikidayanrealudit at buhayilang.com. I'll, I'll post this slide again. Or easier maybe to remember, at Daydreaming Biologist PH on Instagram. So we have this wonderful map of the Philippines on the right from art.com. And here we go. Table of contents. Uh, as I said, these are basically the presentation goals in a short in short lines. And I'll be discussing DNA barcoding first and then DNA sequencing incorporated with hypothesis testing. And then after that, just a few slides on um, building that global global village that I would like to share you with, share with you. There you go. So what is so when we talk about DNA barcoding, it is specifically this process. You have species, you get the DNA, and you get a barcode. And this barcode is akin to the barcode that we have in grocery stores, where if you scan it, then you show the species. Um, DNA barcoding is really a, somewhat like a species delimita delimitation or identification species of technology, which, as you see on the left, which, was, which are like um, old school resources and references when we started thinking about what a species is, uh, what exactly a speci species is, and we gave um, jargon like operational taxonomic unit or evolutionary significant units. And then maybe if we had uh, a systematics course before, we would know the biological species concept, phylogenetic species concept, uh, evolutionary species concept, all of this um, um, encompassing, trying to pinpoint what that species, um, where does the species line go? Um, and the good thing about DNA barcoding is that it became really popular and became a standardized um, pipeline wherein now there's an international consortium, which is the International Barcode of Life. You can check it out at eyeball.org. And there you go. And when we say it's international and it has been, it has a good pipeline, if you look for DNA barcoding in the Philippines, we have this is a typical search that every one of us does as we, every one of us um, go through when we're researching something. And if you can see, there's like the three icons on my left, your left, but the, the food, medicine, and forensics. These are the kind of sexy ideas that's that are connected with DNA barcoding. Um, food in terms of um, food safety, food production, maybe pest reduction, medicine in terms of uh, looking at herbal medicines and um, health-wise in, in, in terms of the health of the environment. And then forensics, which is such a lovely, um, Sound school word, um, a stig, uh, wherein we try to trace what happened to um, different um, specimens that we actually recover from the illegal trade. So, this is a sampling. This Google search is a sampling. So, um, that you see, so you have there the food safety at the bottom. Can you see my? There you go. Um, at the bottom, which is like detection of mislabeled commercial fishery byproducts in the Philippines. So 
sometimes there's no accurate labeling and it's sometimes your fish, it says tuna, but it's not actually tuna. If you buy those fish fillets that are in styro or whatever. And then this is what I was meaning by food security, wherein like DNA barcoding applied to invasive leaf miners. So just, just to, to um, study how this pest um, occupies the, um, the crop areas, then you have DNA barcoding technology pipelines applied to it. And last is the illegal trade of regulated and protected aquatic species in the Philippines, which is basically saying um, we want to check, we want to have this baseline of information wherein you can check against the protected species and also find out if there are other species that are not supposed to be there. And the very basic is at the top, it's just like basically straight barcoding of fish at the alley. So this is also one of the things that can be done with DNA barcoding. You go out, you sample, and then you, um, you sequence the cytochrome oxidase one, and then that's it. Then you see, um, then you have reference um, barcodes for this species already. Okay. So, so that's, uh, I discussed the DNA barcoding applied to invasive leaf miners. So this is um, uh, a very, very um, invasiveness of um, species in the environment is a very rich topic to mine right now. And, and uh, DNA barcoding, really especially with arthropods you are able to um at least assign this this species this barcode which you may find again in another site um one of my favorite uh dna barcoding um, projects which was done by uh, mr pedales at al at university of the philippines ib is this philippine herbal medicinal products and we all know that there we have rich tradition of using herbal herbal medicine and a lot of it um, for example um, let's say banaba has has had very has had varied st studies that the carosolic acid actually works for what it is um, herbal medicine of and just having that specific very easy to understand concept wherein you get this specific herbal, herbal medicine, medicinal product from whoever, from, from the locals, from the supermarket, from wherever. And then what you do is you get the, you take this as the samples, and then you go through the DNA barcoding pipeline, which is basically um, this, this, uh, this sequence right here, wherein you have DNA extraction, PCR amplification, electrophoresis, and then sequencing. And um, aside from the collection of the specimens and the actual lab work, um, one of the things that is really important when we're aiming to do barcoding is that we need to be ready for the amount of information that we're getting. And a lot of it can be pushed into that cloud of bioinformatics. Um, and that's that's where the last part of the figure goes. Um, species identification using this barcode. But wait, there's more. And as I said, sexy is a sexy dust. Um, sexy by I mean when I mean when I say sexy, I mean these are the projects that get funded or that has a lot of opportunities for funding. So we have here still from IB is uh, uh, a project, uh, basically a review of all the barcoding uh, that has been done on Philippine taxa. And if you look at figure three, um, these are all the contributing um, countries that have done DNA barcoding of Philippine animal taxa. And a reason for that very 
high bar with Canada is that can Canada actually is where DNA barcode the DNA barcoding um, um, protocol and basically push started from. So they really were into looking um, looking at and making sure that there were a lot of barcodes that we that they were establishing. Um, this has shifted now to the what I mentioned the International Consortium on the Barcoding of Life. Um, which is more still, um, which is a bigger mix of countries, but still, um, Canada really, Canada really like has went ahead of the race just because they were the first to do so. Um, the other bar is USA, and a lot of this, um, if you look at the actual article, is that these are these are collaborations with Philippine Filipino scientists. And the third bar is Philippines, um, probably because we are slowly creeping up on um, getting these technologies established. And one of the really exciting for me um, is fellow forensics in action, wherein the scenario is you get this, this random um, specimen, monitor lizard in this case, and you are asked, where did this come from? How am I? How? How are you as a scientist going to answer that um, when you're asked by uh, enforcement officers, what, how am I, how am I going to trace where did, where this trafficking line went or how do we trace this illegal traffickers or poachers from collection in the area up to the, up to the, where it was confiscated. So this was this was a fun read, uh, wherein uh, it was found that the specimen that got confiscated was actually from Masbate Island, based on just one other specimen before it, that that was sequenced before. Okay, so I love the way that. Um, the international barcode of life, life defines DNA barcodings, which is really a tool for specimen identification and species discovery. So when we couch it in like that, it's very, it's very clear what the boundaries are, what is it for and what it's not for. And you see here, this is the process of your, of your barcoding. Um, this is a simple process in terms of the steps as how we are looking at it. So you isolate DNA from the sample, amplify the target DNA barcode region using PCR, it's very important, sequence the PCR products, and then you compare the result sequences against reference database to find the matching species. So keyword there is that you have reference databases. And you have different... Um, barcoding regions that you can use and the standard basic standards are for plants would be your placid regions your rbcl and matk and then the non-coding spacer trnh psba and its regions for animals it's easy to remember it's the mitochondrial cytochrome c oxidase one gene and then for fungal barcoding studies you are still stuck with the internal trans the ITS regions. Um, here we have on the lower on the lower half of this part of panel is your markers that have been used for DNA barcoding in different organism groups, and these are a list of what taxa there are and what marker gene or locus was used for each specific taxa. So. As scientists, as students um, that are asked to come up with reports and do review of rela related literature, we know that we are not supposed to cite Wikipedia, right? Like this is just one of the things. Don't cite Wikipedia. You need to cite journal articles, books, at the very least, educational um, education websites, not edu. But we are all critical thinkers. And what I'd like to offer you is that 
when it comes to statistics and um, phylogenetic methods or molecular tools, Wikipedia is a very good um, self-learning module. And, and that's why I, I include here. So just Google DNA barcoding, Wikipedia, it has everything that you need to know about DNA barcoding at a glance. Uh, and why am I saying this? Because when I entered um, KU, the only thing that I was, not the only thing, but like um, I came to KU with the skills of, I work in the lab, but a lot of it was plant tissue culture, but my experience was on microsatellites, um, which is like totally far back already. <laughs> Uh, I don't know who uses microsatellites anymore, but one of the things that um, I got exposed to or was able to perform in the lab um, as part of my minor as a molecular, in molecular bio, biology and biotechnology was DNA extraction. I remember pounding liquid night, uh, like pounding samples of fish and rice with liquid nitrogen for some reason. And then we were able to do PCRs, which are polymerase chase reactions. We had thermocyclers at um, UPLB and then gel electrophoresis, which is basically how you visualize your, your PCR results. And what, what, looking back now is those skills were very important in me being able to understand um, Sanger sequencing and next gen sequencing. And if you have um, the opportunity to do some very routinary, uh, straightforward lab work, try to grab those opportunities. And after this, um, as they say, um, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I would like to put this forward just for us to start the, this story of mine where in the past two years that I've been um, that I've been going through this journey that I call a roller coaster journey because it's just got ups and downs and ups and downs. And one of the things that got me through is that, it might be complicated, but if you trust that you're going to have a roller coaster ride that will end, that will go down and up, and sometimes you're screaming and sometimes you're drooling, then you make sure that you can hang on to the end. And um, one of the things that I see in molecular analysis, molecular tools, sequencing is that it's really a tool and this tool can be used. It's a good thing to have in your wheelhouse so you can use it in a lot of different ways. Oops, there. So from the end of A barcoding, we go to DNA sequencing. So DNA barcoding is basically that specific pipeline of you identifying your species from a specific um, from a specific um, gene or locus. And that's basically done, mostly done, traditionally done with Sanger sequencing. So it's still the gold standard and it's the most common direct method for obtaining sequence data using polymerase chain reaction. So um, the other side of it, we have next generation sequencing which is a relatively low cost and high throughput method pipeline that gives you a genome wide data set. So you have Sanger sequencing, you have this specific gene or genes if you wanna um, sequence a lot, we'll go into that later. And then you have gen next generation sequencing wherein you're actually getting a lot of reads and putting it together um, basically, it's like a puzzle that you put in, put into one whole picture. Okay, there you go. So, what is Sanger sequencing? So, basically, Sanger sequencing, you focus. Let's start with a single locus, 
um, you have your reagents, you have your, this, um, a lot of my professors refer to it as something like cooking, like you have a recipe, you have the ingredients, aka reagents, and then you have the instructions from one to n. So you have your nucleotides, of course, so that's, um, I hope everyone is familiar with um, ATGC. And then you have your polymerase and your primers. So your primers attach to your sample. And then the sample, and then it goes along through that line of DNA so that you hit the specific um, nucleotides. And then you check that and you see that with your electrophoresis and then you have a sequence analysis and reconstruction at the end. So at the end, when you do, you follow the pipeline, you are gonna basically get this sequence of nucleotides that you can use in a lot of analysis tools. Very simple in theory, also very simple in doing the lab work. The trick is into making sure that your primers are the right ones for your um, questions. And two would be if your polymerase chain reaction is um, settings are good for your sample for your primers. So you could probably say if everything goes right, you can probably handle 90, 96, which is like the big number of wells, 96 samples in a day and a half because you have to add your polymerase the day before. But then are you going to be sure that all of those um, that you sequenced, that you ran your electrophoresis and your PCRs on will give you a result? So that is where I put the mark here, wherein it's easy, it's not easy, it's understandable, it's very routinary, but let's not forget that we are still scientists going into it, into it and looking at how we're doing the methods. And if you are doing a study and you plan to sequence this, this, and this, you have to make sure that you take time to calibrate and make sure that your protocol works for your specific samples, um, for your specific um, primers, for your specific conditions. Okay, so that's one locus. You have one locus, um, like DNA, so DNA barcoding, when you say I have cytochrome oxidase one, for animals. So that's one locus. And then you do singer sequence, sequence, Sanger sequencing there. And then with that specific locus, you have your uh, cytochrome ox oxidase one. There you have your barcode. So it's a bit overlapping these concepts, but I just wanted to make sure which is the lab um, activity, basically, and your um, sequence of protocols. So after single locus, we will look at, one moment, there you go. So we, uh, so this is the next page of Googling DNA barcoding in the Philippines. And as I said, you really have to make sure that you have time in your project, in your thesis, in your study to have um, the methodological aspect of it. Um, basically you say efficiency of the prime the sequences that you chose or you have evaluation of this specific barcodes when in your specific taxa for this in this case it's Leia and then um, you have here uh, aposinaceae or plants basically and then and then Maybe it may be easier to just choose some, um, to choose a primer set, a gene that has been used several times and 
is um, is and is standardized. So this is what's happening with your DNA barcodes of Philippine accipitrids or accipitridae. So these are your uh, raptors. But wait, there's more. So you have here, it is still Sanger sequencing and some more um, detailed, like zoomed in version in the sense that you have your forward primer and your verse primer, and then you have your entrance and your accents, and that's your tar target gene at the top there at A. And uh, as it says, Sequencing primers and use existing PCR primers when possible. Um, science is built upon the back of other scientists, previous scientists' work. So try not to reinvent the wheel um, if it's not necessary. And what is so we have now? So we have a single locus. Now we go into multiple multiple loci. So how many is enough? Um, if I have to give a short answer, I'd say two. One nuclear, one mitochondrial, and that's for animals. But it really depends on what your question is and how far you want to go, uh, how deep you want to go when you're looking at your phylogenies. Well, there you go. So here we have um, your lovely... Uh, mammalian diversity, and these are cloud rats, earthworm mice, and we have here uh, phylogenetic. So on your top left, that's basically um, that's basically your graph of a species accumulation curve. So in in the in a, in an elevational and number of native species axis, and then you have this beautiful um, just to entice you. Uh, photographs of different um, mice and rats. They are cute. And you see here with our, which are phylogenies for, uh, for this specific taxa. And in this case, there were two loci that were used um, for this study, specifically one for mammals. And the normal one for this group and uh, cytochrome B, which was, uh, which is which has been used in terrestrial vertebrates aside from um, cytochrome oxidase one. This is another one. There you go. Um, you have, uh, you have two. You have a mitochondria. Uh, protein chondri the still the mitochondria uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA site B and a nuclear locus which is AK1 intron. So if you see like we had the previous study, one moment, can my laptop handle it? Yes, we have the previous study. So we're just looking at specifically in the Philippines, right? And then now we're going global with two um, lo loci basically. And this is your, for your hornbills. And that's one way to go through it. Like you have two, simple enough, nuclear, mitochondrial. But then when you look at the taxonomic sampling, you go all, um, um, all over the world, all the species that you can get for your hornbills globally. And that's, that's really a matter of um, shuffling and juggling those uh, priorities. Um, and of course, we might we will definitely not forget the fact that we have timelines, we have funding, we have capabilities, and that really depends on what every specific person that's doing um, your sequencing. And next. How about if I have nine? So we have here, which is um, one of my favorite snakes. So you have Boygar, the cat-eyed snakes, also known as the mango snakes for some reason. Um, and the breadth of the area that you could somehow 
um, somehow check your tax against here. Um, you have different geographic regions. So this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's eight minimum of eight biogeographic regions. And then you have um, as many boiga species as possible on the right. And the thing with this is that it really depends on, my professor in ecology always used to say the answer should be it depends. It really depends on what um, the, how deep the level of your questions are going. Because um, honestly, you can do anything that you want in terms of molecular tools, technology, um, analysis. It's all just basically limited by what you are willing to do and willing to learn and understand and the resources that you are, um, that you are, that you can access. But it really goes, boils down to like, what exactly are you asking? So that was all Sanger sequencing. Very um, easy to understand. You have one gene, you sequence it, you have primers. And then maybe you can have not just one gene, but two or nine or two again, depends. So why would you, we want to look at next generation sequencing? So, well, the thing is with a next, when we're looking at a single locus or even a multiple multi-locus study, think of it as you um, when you're doing morphometrics and you're weighing and you're getting the weight or the snout vent length. Yes, I am biased. I'm, I'm a terrestrial wildlife biologist. You have snout vent length, you have weight, maybe tail length or forelimb length. And each one somehow informs you of the organism. So when you look at a single loc locus, then that might be comparable to, for example, um, to SVL, it's not vent length, or maybe it's comparable to the weight. But, but what I'm saying is that every single locus that you add provides more avenues for evidence that you can use to that you can use to answer your question sometimes they mean the same thing i mean if you measure snout vent length and um, total length and then tail length then one of those would be um, superfluous but you get it anyway but then you don't have time to to just sequence 12 or 13 or four or five or how many is your limit, whatever is your limit, um, just because. So you really have to make sure that you're, you're looking at it. And then when you have a single locus, you're looking at this portion of the DNA and then this another portion of the DNA and this portion of the DNA. So with next generation sequencing, um, these are my photos on the left of me uh, in the lovely um, uh, cryo tank, but not in the, with, <laughs> beside the lovely cryo tank. And this like um, misty thing here is actually nitrogen where we store negative 80 degrees and uh, lower, colder, um, where the DNA specimens, DNA tissues are stored for a long time so that they can still be used um, um, in decades to come. And going back, you have next gen gen generation sequencing, you actually have this genome-wide data set. So um, from next generation sequencing, we go to whole genome sequencing, which is not part of my talk, but that's basically um, what, what what the maximum you can do. The minimum is one locus, single locus. The maximum is like you sequence the whole genome, but nobody has, not a lot of people has that um, resources, have that resources to um, sequence the whole genome. And frankly, we don't necessarily need to sequence the whole genome of every single animal or plant or life in, 
in this world, unless we have a lot of money, maybe. Um, so the next best, best thing, like the one in intermediate is your next generation sequencing. And then when you're looking at next generation sequencing, it's high throughput and you have shorter sequence reads and you're looking at coverage. So if you look at the entire genome, the breadth of this A from one line to that line, um, then when you say high coverage whole genome sequencing, that's what we have. That's, that's the maximum that we get. So you have, um, you have a lot of um, sequences that you can piece together, as I said, like a puzzle. And then maybe you have low coverage because that's the only thing that you can um, do with your resources. And it still works specifically for different set of questions. Um, sometimes we have exome sequencing and rad sequencing wherein you have um, certain regions in, in the DNA that you're targeting still, but at a factor of 10 rather than just once. And the best thing about this is this, if one person does high coverage, one person does low coverage, and another person does just exome sequencing or rad sequencing, you can actually pull this together and maybe, not maybe, but probably you will have a better picture of what is happening across the genome. And there you have your genome-wide data set. Um, fair warning, um, having a genome-wide data set is not for the faint of heart. It's a lot of bioinformatics and um, it really takes a deep dive into next generation sequencing to actually um, have a study that goes through. You really, my, my opinion is you really need to be interested in the systems or in the hypothesis that you're asking, which brings me to there. So we, which brings me to hypothesis testing. So um, hopefully um, a lot of you are familiar with your uh, faunal regions or what um, we refer to in the Brown Lab as places in aggregate island complexes. So. Uh, the thing is, like, you have this um, land masses um, of land masses currently, which are green here, and then you have light blue shading here, which were the areas before that had um, land connectivity somehow. And um, when we look at the Philippines, we have a lot of lines the Huxley, Huxley's line, Wallace's lines, Weber's line, Lidiger's lines, which are basically lines saying, this is where your species come from on the left or on the right or on wherever part. Um, Huxley's lines, basically a modification Palawan species are like separate from the Philippines. And then you have the traditional Wallace line. And what it gives us is a very good um, null hypothesis, I would say not necessarily null, but like uh, an H1 at the very least, um, wherein um, does your species follow all of this, the distribution and the phylogeny follow the PAIC system? Or like, are those that are in Mindoro, did those, do those species in Mindoro come from one ancestor that landed on Mindoro and then spread and um, you, ha you have radiation in, in the island, within the island, or um, you might well um, test hy uh, different hypotheses wherein you have across the years, um, you have uh, different results for different taxa, which is here um, from this art. These are all from the same article by Brown et al., which is basically evolutionary excuse me, processes of diversification in a model island archipelago. And A is a sample where in geckos basically came from the Palawan raft and then landed on the Philippines and then spread out. Or B, you have here, there's a dual invasion hypothesis wherein you have this um, 
species of Limnonectes or Hylarana. These are wonderful, cute frogs that are easy to catch. <laughs> Basically, going through Philippines in two, from two directions. And then maybe there are multiple funnel exchanges between those are the arrows there in uh, between Mindanao and Sulawesi. Or you have another scenario wherein you have this wonderful um, uh, 34 endemic species of Brachymilis, which is a skink, uh, limbless skinks, and they go back and forth like across um, Luzon and Visayan and Mindoro uh, islands in terms of dispersal and going around and where they come from. So all of these are like different scenarios that you can use um, your, your sequencing um, methods to figure out which of this happened for which specific taxa, for which specific time period. Oops. Let's enter. And so this is basically the, um, the different geological features and tectonic evolution of the archipelago that happened. So this is why we have, um, why we have, we started with the places and aggregate island complexes. And then for B is your um, microcontinent block, like how I said with a gecko. And C is basically the different uh, routes that you can take or um, arcs that we have when you look at the distributions of um, different vert terrestrial vertebrates. And so we have this, this hypothesis testing, and we're looking for um, we're looking for methodologies to actually address your hypothesis, which one of these we think are more likely. And we have here um, during a lab discussion, um, we can look at all of this in terms of islands. Um, but then we can also actually look at this um, using uh, the part A of figure two, wherein we see where the, por the portions of Luzon Island were separated and slammed into each other. And then maybe you have transition zones. And that's also one of the things that you can check um, within, within that line. You have like the species on the right in Bicol Peninsula and Central Luzon. You have you figure out where they come from and how they diversified in those uh, across that transition zone. And one of my favorites is when you add in the story of ecological niche models. And then here you have on these small cute birds there. And you have the kingfisher and the flower pecker, so the same and the six. And you see what parts of the the islands were are they in now, and how they spread across the Philippines. And you have two different bird species, and both are birds, but <laughs> but they have two different ways they showed different ways of getting to where they are currently. And aside from this um, niche modeling estimate, another um, version of um, this kind of hypothesis testing is basically when you um, check how your communities, island communities, um, originated from or how they came to be. So for example, we have an island, let's still go for Mindoro. So you have Mindoro or the species of, of skinks on Min Mindoro, uh, let's say Luzon, because it's bigger. Are the skinks in Luzon like, did one ancestor arrive there and then diversified, or were there different, um, different times where in different ancestors went and then they diversified, or were those that 
um, that came there and then diversified, but then got extinct where they landed. So those are, um, this is basically what your figure seven is in terms of evolution of island communities or assembly. So they did, they did, did they arrive there or did they evolve from one specific arrival? And, and so when we look at that, we say, um, we say we use um, we use Sanger sequencing for a lot of those a lot of those um, hypotheses. So one may wonder: Do we really next need next generation sequencing in terms of the the hypothesis that we would like to aim for? And that's basically it. It's your call. One end of the study specifically gets to decide. As I said, these are tools. You, you determine which level of tools you need to look out for. And here, which is a very basic um, hypothesis, wherein you test the monophyly of this Luperosaurus gecko. And then with your next, with your Sanger sequencing, you find that Luperosaurus actually is not, I hope it's obvious, um, monophyletic. And there you go. That's your question. But on the other hand, on the right part, we have here a study by Swanson et al., which is basically a phylogenetic tree with the, the title is A Phylogenetic Rodent Tree Reveals the rep Repeated Evolution of Master, master Architectures. And if you're wondering what the master architectures are, it's here which are very strained right now because I've been talking for a while. And you see here this time calibrated phylogeny for a specific, let's say for a specific trait, which is your masseter, and then the uh, different kinds of masseter. And what they used here was, what they used here was ultra conserved elements, which are basically your elements your regions that are conserved in different um, related taxa. And then as far the flanking regions to this ultra conserved elements, basically the one adjacent to it, um, from that point onwards to, to the length of your flanking regions and how far they come from that ultra conserved elements, they, are, they become more variable when they're more far, further away. And, why are we excited about next generation sequencing? And so here we have uh, a lot of species that are in the Philippines. And when we see Philippine species contextualized in a broader um, taxonomic lens or um, a different a wider, maybe deeper lens, we see the, what I always am fascinated by is that as an, as an island, or island, island archipelago, we can actually literally, theoretically, not literally, like with very good imagination, see evolutioning, evolution happening. And, and that's what I think is wonderful about the, the Philippine, Philippines as a model system or a testing system for this, um, for this kind of questions in that we have a variety of forces that made our country in, from different sources and our taxa being able to adjust and adapt and speciate and this and having this as a lens makes it i think i definitely think it's wonderful because you can evolution is very hard to process in terms of like as a whole concept but the fact that you can anchor evolution 
in Philippine diversity, biodiversity, and on the Philippine archipelagic system, then I think it's um, it's one of the things that a lot of the next generation of scientists can explore. So that's UCEs for ma uh, masseters for rodents, and then we have here um, snakes, pythons. And we have there, where is our python? We have the Malayo python reticulatus there. And you have million years, millions of years ago, and you can just see like where it is in place of the other clades. And there is, of course, a caveat in, in when we're doing this because um, we're always estimating. So look at the this red bars basically mean that you're like, you can. You can look at it from this point to this point. So here to this point. And that's the hard thing with um, with learning your analysis tools in terms of um, sequencing. The sequencing technology, like how it's done, is getting faster and rapider and is there such a word as rapid? More rapid. Uh, and also the analysis tools are getting more and more, not complicated, but there's different molecular tools that analysis and um, analysis and a lot of um, numbers and indices that you can you can use to describe your data or how how your um, sequences are, but it's all changing right now. And one has to be not really on top of it, but to make sure one has to be at that level wherein the processes are understood so that even if you, even if you, um, for let's say teach high school for three years and forget um, all the um, high tech, uh, the new novel technologies, because you were too busy earning a living for three years. Then, but if you get the processes, um, the basics, right, or like at least you understand it fully, then you can just anchor that with the new technologies coming our our way. And this is one of the um new um technologies here in terms of uh oops in terms of in terms of um sequencing is that in this study in this phylogenomics um biogeography and morphometric studies on pythons in this area so that's the area there borneo Sulawesi. And the thing is with that, with that, you see that phylogenomics, your sequences, when you make it into a tree, is one line of evidence. So what you do is like you try to not just use that one line of evidence in the same way that you would just not measure snap band length or form length and then use that for everything. But you make sure that you add more lines of evidence and make sure that um, here we have morphometrics. Um, here we they measure the volume of the total body and also the head uh, of the snakes. And the thing with, with that is it's even if we have like new technology, we always have to make sure that we still are using our traditional data sets and integrate that to our new technology and new analysis tools. Because um, especially in natural history, when we're looking at taxons, then we are sure that we are sure that we are sure that it's not out of, it's not theoretical, it's still empirical and it's it's based 
on the observations of um, other biologists of the past. One moment, yes. But then what's the beauty of it? So you have the pythons and you have morphometrics and multiple lines of evidence. The beauty of it is when you do get this baseline, you have multiple sequences that were sequenced, multiple loci that were sequenced, it's all in the bank. You have some form of genome-wide data set for um, ultra-conserved elements or other, um, other NGS data what happens is the beauty of this is that the data set genomic data sets genomic data are all placed into genbank and every single um sequence that you come up with that you that you get piles on top of each other up to the point that it's a big mountain and it just avalanches into one such uh, project like this, wherein there was, um, these are one of my favorite birds, the Chogons. We have in the Philippines, one species, which is Herpactus ardens. Um, fun fact, uh, this is what some of our locals call Ibong Adarna or Tangilala, just because um, they sound like, a, they sound like they're almost sort of laughing for their call and Ibong Adarna because just because it looks very colorful and has that majesty that we all learn about the Ibong Adarna um, when we were kids during Filipino class. And in this thing, you have library prep. So you have sequences. And then, then you have library preparation. So think of your sequence as a book, and then you have a whole library of it already. And one of the things that you're designing or you're making sure you have it right with, with Sanger sequencing was to make sure that your, your primers were um, are good and actually well-designed or have been used several times for the specific taxa. But here you have your adapters and you make sure that your adapters are adapting well, no joke, <laughs> are, uh, are um, solid enough so that you can actually have a good alignment or assembly when you run it through. So here, um, hypothesis-wise, we have rapid laration diversification of a pan-tropical bird family. So basically, you're looking at um, Laurasia and where it diversi diversified during which time period, which is basically your oligocene myosin transition. Why am I repeating this? Because next would be, so this one is a wonderful um, study on passeriformes or songbirds, which are basically like, if you see a bird, it's probably a songbird. Um, and it didn't even fit into one graph. So <laughs> one figure, just two figures, and they need to be on top of each other to make sense because passeriformes are really a lot. And you can actually look at that list of authors. So it becomes uh, a whole group of authors that does different specific things. And because, especially with birds, um, uh, when we're looking at, Threshold vertebrates is usually the birds that pave the way for a lot of the technologies because um, there's a lot of funding and interest in birds. Um, then you have this data sets that are on top of each other, which are UCEs, multiple loci, exons, exon sequences, and then you are able to understand evolution at a global le level for a lot of taxa. For one specific clade, more or less, passeriformis, but really for a lot of different species. And that's, I think, is the beauty of it, is that when we're working to do sequence sequencing and applying it to the different, to the different, uh, hypothesis that we have, we are not working in a vacuum. Um, we say that 
uh, it takes a it takes a village to raise a child. So it takes a metaphorical village to actually come up with these papers and with these studies. So just to stop and give a little bit break. So uh, that's me, my photo for when I am in teacher mode and trying to hammer in what the stuff that um, I talk about for a long time. Uh, well, it should be obvious. Uh, we should collect DNA tissues and museum specimens. Um, you can't have DNA sequencing without the DNA. And then as scientists, um, early career or mid-career, you make sure that your protocols are well-tested, well-researched, and then you can able to make your pipelines, basically, which is basically a flow chart of all your of all the things you need to do to get your analysis and to answer your hypothesis. And then at the end, you really have to make sure that you have multiple lines of evidence. Um, just make sure that when we're doing, um, we're using molecular tools, then you might integrate that with um, other data sets just so that it doesn't exist in a vacuum. And of course, one of the things really is garbage in, garbage out. If you have crappy DNA, then you're not going to get a good sequence to it. If you have bad laboratory skills, you're not going to be able to get your, to get your, to get your multiple sequence reads in a good quality. And, and that's really one of the things that we need to make sure that we're ready for when we're looking at this kind of things because it's it has so many steps that you should one should be committed to making sure that um, each step was done um, to the best of what the resources are and but there's so many there's so many uh, there's so many. Um, next generation sequencing that we have and a lot of hypotheses that can be answered with it. But it's also um, uh, doing barcoding is also one of the things that we still can do up till now. And one of the pitch that I would like to say is that um, you have environmental DNA or meta barcoding, wherein when you have a good baseline of all your the barcodes of your species, let's say 90% of the taxa in the Philippines, woo, um, then you're able to make sure, then you're able to utilize this as a reference. So when you can um, collect water samples, you might be able to do DNA barcoding on the sample of water that you have, or maybe I would, there's this study wherein you can do some form of barcoding with the blood in a limatic or in a leech, which basically um, preys on your vertebrates. So you know that there's still probably a water pig somewhere in the mountain. So it really takes uh, this, this scenarios with Eden and metabar coding. These are very, um, these are very clear things that we can see clear things that we can see and we can recognize in terms of management or how 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 we can grasp it but this would not be possible without the first basic step of always as we say um before we do a study we need to have a baseline studies and speaking of baseline studies these are the team that i went with to mount apple looking for herbs and being very, very cold. Um, this picture is credited to Jojen Sanguenza. And that's the basic of it. Uh, we need to get our boots dirty. We need to get out because we are still not at the stage uh, with Philippine taxa that we can actually just stay in, in our labs and just do all the lab work without collecting. Then, here, to answer this very funny question, um, 
how to be you po. Please don't be like me. I don't need to be anyone else. You are yourself and you are unique to yourself. Um, <laughs> but uh, I would just like to say that it is a learning curve. I would say a slow learning curve to learn this kind of technologies and analysis. But if you just look at it one step at a time, then you'll probably get there to the end. And for my thing is that when I, uh, when I answer how to be you, po, it's basically how to be a person who can understand all of this technology and publish someday and be like, you know, have the title of a scientist. So we have to go back to the basics, which is basically, I hope it's obvious with the slides. Um, we have to go back. We have to make sure that our genetics, um, we are, our genetics principles are sound and we understand them very well. And I put here a picture of me after teaching this genetics class. It is hard and some of them are not really that easily grasped as compared to animal ecology or taxonomy. But the more that you go through it like once or twice or thrice in your career, every time you teach it, every time um, you need to review something, just go ahead because it will stick. And another thing is that um, there are so many resources already out there that, uh, that you can self-study and, and follow a pipeline. So this one is actually just a phylogenetics project that they did during my first sem in KU. And just following the step-by-step -step actually gave me that insight on how to make my own pipeline for my um, thesis project and but of course if we can all learn everything by ourselves then teachers should be out of jobs um, we really we're social creatures so we need to learn from other people so maybe you have your lab group and you may have um, what I call discussion groups and like peer discussion groups in the in the way that people will talk about an article or an innovation or a technology or a pipeline and understand it with this course with the other uh, members of your peers. And I would like to um, um, enjoin everyone to uh, check out at Pinoy Scientist in, on IG and Facebook, I think it's the same name. And you can see in very layman terms what um, what the technologies are out there because there are people all over the world that are studying specific things and you can just basically choose which line you want to go to. Uh, next, yes. And then, as they said, you know, as they say in Facebook, PM is the key when you're selling merchandise or food. Um, I would say like email is the key. Uh, when we're looking at this, when we're trying to learn different sets of technologies and pipelines, especially with the analysis tools, because nowadays there's all there's this movement to have everything on a database so that you can literally replicate what another person has done on one study. And the best thing to do that, to understand that, is to go to the source. So if you have a paper using this novel probe set you ask the specific person how they made the process the how to use the probe set and this goes back to my one moment this goes back to what i said before that let's not reinvent the wheel we can use each other to lift ourselves up and just ask um, especially during the pandemic um, where everyone's been used to having Zoom meetings across the world, having Zoom conferences. Um, people are applying now to emails because it's the only way that you get work done. And maybe um, I started with um, just using microsatellites with no background on, not a lot of background on making phylogenetic trees. Um, 
after a while, I was able to make these trees here that I sh that I'm showing. So these are basically um, thirty uh, snake genera, and on the right is just a colorful thing. I like I like looking at it. But these are all generated with R, which is one thing that a person might want to go through. Next slide. There you go. Um, want to go through when, when they're an understanding um, these kinds of studies. And if you really want to go through these kinds of studies. And these are all the <laughs> programs that you might want to be familiar with, you might want to start with. I'm speaking to the fact that the demograph of my audience was a lot of college students in different, um, in different schools in the Philippines are probably looking for um thesis thesis ideas um and one of the things that i always say is like bioinformatics is basically you have large data sets and you use those large data sets to tell you a story or to give meaning to your hypothesis to prove or this not this, to prove or to provide evidence or um have a story from it and one of the things that we all can access right now without um, any resource aside from a laptop and your internet is the QIG, QGIS and spatial, spatial um, dynamics, spatial analysis. These are all analysis that have kind of large-ish data sets depending on what you're looking at. And you can use that to so that when you're looking at genome-wide data sets, you are not overwhelmed uh, with the amount of data that you have to uh, that you have to deal with and analyze. And of course, R and R Studio um, are also free, and there's a lot of tutorials and packages and all the things to do. But what it it does is it modifies your way of thinking to a computer language base so that you can program in your head. It is very good for doing pipelines. And Zotero is for making sure that right now, wherever you are, you have a citation reference, citation manager, because uh, it's gonna be the bread and butter of any, any scientist. And if you're starting now and you're, you're, um, you're still copy pasting your citations, it might, it might work, it worked for me for a while but then you're gonna handle a lot of um, reference after and just starting now building that library with your citation manager would be useful. Adobe Illustrator basically for making figures and um, all these figures, I really thought when I started, when I entered KU that the figures for this, um, this nice fancy, uh, phylogenetic trees were like they come out of the they come out of the program like tada it's so pretty and then I'll just put a label on it. Apparently it's not. You have to build your figures and figure design is a whole big thing and one of the things that can help would be Adobe Illustrator. And if you're going gung ho and definitely going into the into the world of um, next gen sequencing. Uh, you might want to try and learn Python, which is a programming language. When I was a kid, we learned C++. <laughs> and um, now it's Python. And you can use that for a lot of the analysis tools that you, that you, will, that you will use when you get your genome-wide data sets. And, oops, there. And then, so this is, this is also an example of the spatial analysis that I was talking about in terms of like just making sure that you understand what large data sets are and how to how to maybe translate a sort of vague, not easily tangible data with something that you can put on paper and understand it. Um, so this is on uh, the one on the left is like a 2005 article. It's very easy. You have important buried areas and boundaries and what are the gap and recommendations. And you have here um, Sublayan. Um, no, not Sublayan. 
something else. Um, well, it's Mount Tiburan, IBA, and you're just looking at the different species there. And then on the right is 15 years-ish later, uh, at least a decade later, and you're looking at land cover. And, and this is the kind of um, the kind of concepts that and processes that may affect your um, the story that you're telling with your data sets. So um, I don't know if I succeeded, but I hope that I was able to um, reach my presentation goals. Uh, and if you want to email me, just go ahead. Um, I will just ask also uh, UPL uh, Sir Flor to put my email in that recording of the presentation. And from my end, the I would like to say that the days of single authorship studies are mostly over and that it takes a global village um, to do certain kinds of projects and part of that I think is a good training for uh, students nowadays so that they can work as a team with other different cultures and also um, you get to access different resources in different ways and the best argument for me for having establishing those networks and uh, is that you know that you're not the only one doing the thing that you're doing and that you're not the only one fighting against the odds or you're not the only one that has to prove themselves so that you can push on this certain type of technology or analysis. So as my, my favorite um, field um, expedition, field expedition organizer says, um, go out, collect data, and save the world. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive presentation on that talk on DNA barcoding and uh, next generation sequencing. So I'm sure that a lot of, uh, of our, the members of our audience have lots of questions uh, and they would be probably throwing some interesting questions for you. So, but let me start the ball rolling. So I'm not familiar with DNA research work in particular because it's out of my field. But uh, my question for the moment is, it, um, is that based on your experiences, um, what are the upsides and downside of DNA, uh, working with DNA for biodiversity here in the Philippines? So that is that's a very lovely question, Sir Flor. Um, one of I have this friend before that's a molecular biologist, and they were they literally put it in one statement. It's like um, DNA sequencing and DNA barcoding is really like an act of faith because you're doing all these protocols, but you can't actually see with your with your naked eye what you're actually getting. And when we work with Philippine biodiversity, especially if you've been out in the field, it's very tangible. You can see the, the bat will bite you when you take out off the net. You can hear the bird calls. You're, you're gonna go crawl through the mud so that you can catch a frog. So it, it, it is a bit of a shift of perspective that we have from being field biologists and getting out into the field and collecting your species data or your habitat data and shifting to that very um, amorphous kind of data that will just show up in your computer and will show up in different, um, in your gel electrophoresis, for example. Okay, so um, uh, follow up lang. Um, with DNA barcoding, you know, the, the process specimens can be identified. And I think the origin can be traced back so thus you can check the you know it's, a, it's like a it's, it's like a way how to detect whether there's illegal trade so do you know at whether there's an existing agreement between the philippines and other countries uh, which is now sharing uh, dna information so that they both can benefit from this uh, 
scientific method? So as I said, um, everything that is in a study needs to be in GenBank in terms of sequences. So that's basically the database that you can get. Whoever does, I I have, I mean, at, I have, uh, at the very least, I would say like, if you published, you have your data set there. And at, at one end, like people won't do barcoding and then not publish and just have it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing. And I know um, there's a lot of talk before with the, I don't know if I'm correct, but uh, there was this consortium on making sure that biodiversity information, DNA, and such. Um, I don't want to mention the name that I in my head. Um, is it the Nagoya Protocol, wherein we're sure that um, there's feedback or there's an accountability to where um, the specimens come from your DNA. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the things really for me is that when you're getting your DNA tissues anyway, you're handling your specimens and that should is and is covered by a lot of um, permitting process um, legally and uh, nationally and internationally. So we have one question, anonymous question here. Um, basically, a question with uh, several comments. Okay, what will you say about the importance of a well-sampled number of species and uh, barcoding? How significant is the sample size to delimit the species in terms of molecular analysis? This is basically talking on the importance of physical collections for integrative taxonomic purposes. That sounds very familiar. I want to guess who actually asked that question. But um, okay, we say we anchor with integra- integrated taxonomic purposes. So um, I struggle a lot with this question in the sense that I really need to know the, the I really need to know the question or the problem that we're solving. Because for example, I have uh, my wonderful parrots uh we let's go to the colasisi or the hanging parrots which has like 10 subspecies in the philippines and if you sample that's speci- one specific parrot that's only just one species in the philippines so that's lyriculus philippensis and then you sample that against all the hanging parrots in sulawesi so sulawesi has like four a lot of endemic ones um then you can say okay i can just sample I can just sample um, just one, just one population because that's Lariculus philippensis. Um, maybe sample the one in Kamigin because that's a different, um, it, it shows very different uh, morphology, quote unquote. And then you have your Philippines versus your Sulawesi. And, and that, that can be it. But when we're, looking at how deep we want to go, would it be part of your question that are we actually looking at populations now? So the thing with the Philippine system is each population becomes in, in a population in an island is not able some most of the time to interbreed with another population, right? And that means that if you're sampling just one representative across the range, then you might actually be not looking at the variation across the range. And going back to the question, if you're a species, the limitation question is just integrative taxonomy, like just flat on like what we're what we've been doing, then okay, it's okay. It's just Lariculus philippensis. But if we're trying to look at evolutionary processes, and maybe affect what is very nice now, like effective climate change or niche modeling or whatever, then you might actually have to look at the different populations where Lariculus is, um, hanging parrot is. And what's fun for me with that kind of integrative taxonomy, you add also phylloforensics on it because um, uh, the hanging parrot is, is like, uh, an established, not established, but like it's known to be a pet for a lot of people. And then some people 
collect from different islands and sell it in Luzon, and then you have something like that. So, but then you wouldn't necessarily have to do that for a specific species of beetle or cockroach in terms of like when you're looking at how you're delineating the species or the population. So that's also what you're looking is, are you looking for a species tree or a genetic uh, gene tree? So okay. it depends. Okay. Dear anonymous, uh, <laughs> anonymous person, I hope that answers your question. Okay. So we have a question here from uh, Mehan Jean Igual. So um, I think she's a student. What research can you recommend in this new normal you know, for a starting student uh, in their thesis? Or probably just yung mga, uh, ones that are simple enough for uh, probably high school student or uh, BS, uh, uh, BS thesis. So that's, that's what I would do. Um, since, since, you know, we're all wildlife biologists at heart and you love species, go look for a taxa, a clade that you are interested in. Look for, go search in Genba, click nucleotides and search for specific um, sequences that might already be there. And then you can build a tree out of that, just, just from that. And of course, it's going to get loopholes. So maybe if you're a bachelor's uh, BS student, yes. then you probably, student. you probably could, you probably could add to that information and sequence stuff yourself. But if you're a high school student, feel free to, to just use that and just make sure that you know what exactly are the limits of your data and your analysis. And that's very good start, I think. Okay, there's a question from Julianne Andrea Innumerable. Uh, good afternoon. So she's asking what is uh, best for DNA barcoding? Uh, would uh, the dry or preserved specimens or fossils be used or are fresh specimens better? That's a very wonderful question, Julianne. I am so glad to have been your teacher. Um, uh, I would advise, uh, really, especially if you're starting, um, the sample on hornbills that I showed was historical DNA, and that was really hard, according to the primary investigator to get. So fresh samples are easier to do lab work on, and especially if you're starting. And I would... Um, for example, for animals, if you can have access to liver, liver would be better. But of course, there's uh, a lot of other non-invasive uh, non-invasive procedures also to get DNA. But the point is that there are specific standards or maybe what is used, uh, current gold standards maybe is what I should say, for which specific part of which specific animal or plant you are going to use as a material. All right. So from James Ariel Nim, uh, his question is, um, in delimiting species, um, is one gene marker enough? Quick answer, no. Mm -hmm. um, but there are um, some uh, it depends on the taxa, if they are very clear cut and have not had a history of sharing, of sympathy or sharing uh, ranges, and you know that this species really just was here and, and that island and there was no way that you could fix, maybe you can do, um, you can go away with one, but I would say just do two, one nuclear, one mitochondrial, and that you can, you're fairly going to be able to see something already for a species limitation. Okay, um, question from Adrian, Adrian Luxon. So, hi, Atinik Dai. <laughs> anyway, DNA barcoding builds a database of the uh, standard markers, example, uh, COI for animals, uh, which can be used for the identification of species. So would you know if there's also a move to standardize or there's a move for standardization at that level for NGS data? No, there is not. So um, the thing with NGS data is that it's, it's 
like I didn't even discuss technologies and how you can can actually get this NGS data because there's many ways already and it's growing so fast. Um, just in two different sense, there's something that I had to study that was not even published or even in the in the in the internet world out there. So um, it still goes back to. Um, there's two ways to go about it. Like one, you can do your own, which is wonderful also. You can do your own for your specific taxa or for your specific question. You can make your own pipeline or two, you can use a pipeline that was just made um, fairly new. Like for example, 2020 article, and then you can ask that author and then you can go through with the pipeline. But yeah, quick answer is no. Okay. Again, from James Ariel Nim, should you consider morphological characters in parallel with molecular characters in delimiting uh, species? Definitely. That's what I said with multiple lines of evidence. Um, we love morphometrics, morphology, and it's one of the things that we can actually have a tangible, um, tangible base of what our adaptations are. Um, and this these data sets are there. There's it's fairly easy to integrate it with molecular data sets. Okay. Not fairly easy, but fairly not complicated. Okay. Can Anon okay. Another anonymous question. Uh, since laboratory activities is limited right now, uh, especially here in the Philippines, I don't know about there at KU. Uh, what types of studies would you re recommend that would contribute to be to DNA barcoding? Well, as usual, there's like meta-analysis. You look at what has been done. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, if I had money, I would start ordering um, those DNA, quick DNA extraction sets, get primers, and send them off to a laboratory somewhere else. So you basically need access to um, that DNA kit plus FedEx, and then you can just send it off. Make sure you have a permit. Um, so that's that's what I would do I'm, if I were in the Philippines right now. All right. Well, I hope that answers your question, Miss Anonymous. <laughs> All right. Uh, any more questions from our audience? Um, no more. I think there. I hope you're uh, okay. There's one from Cyril John Godinez. Thank you very much for that question. I know it's lunchtime, but um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, we have two. Uh, okay, from Cyril John Godinez. Uh, he just wants to know: DNA barcodes are legitimately used for species identification. Do the mitochondrial cytochrome C oxidase (COI) sequences? Uh, can they be alternatively used for mitochondrial DNA control region in analyzing the population history and evolutionary theory? Yes, depending on what species are you. Um, the, for example, cytochrome oxidase 1 for vertebrates can only go so far. So you can just say, okay, this is a species. But when you're looking at deeper questions, then you might want to add cytochrome B and then another nuclear gene and then another mitochondrial gene. Um, but I would, I'd say two. So that, that really depends on what you're studying. All right. From um, Ray, John Raymond Torres, uh, in ethnobotanical studies and considering the indigenous peoples, is it necessary to, to, to do the DNA barcode or to do barcode all the listed species with traditional medical use? Or should I consider only the unknown or at least the reported species with medicinal uh, value or purpose? I'd answer that with, um, there's, there's a lot of, um, I love ethnobotany and there's a lot of traditional medicine use and there's like a whole list of like top 20, top 30, top 40. So as much as your resources can go for um, in the sense that uh, what I would do first would be to check what are already on GenBank and then fill in the gaps with my pro with your project and then uh, 
And then when you do your sample, actual herbal samples, then you can look at that reference. And if there are some unknowns, it's like 1%, 2%, depends on you if you want to chase that down. Um, but you're probably going to be able to like determine which family are those and probably make a very good um, guess on what this species are and you might want to chase that specific um, plant species where your herbal medicine was collected. Yeah, all right. So um, Diane Pelisan wants to know, um, which she would just like to ask, how long do these uh, kind of studies you know, last? Like maybe she's asking, what's the timeline? Can you barcode okay. as, as, as a specimen in, let's say, three months? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, you can do 90 specimens in two days, is mm -hmm, how I should mm -hmm. say. It. Except the preparing for those two days is very hard. And you make sure that you all have the logistics of it is what it's, is what is, the technology is fast. And when you send off first sequence, you may maybe get, I don't know, two weeks at the maximum mm -hmm. if you don't have a, a previous arrangement with your sequencer. But um, the protocol as I've done it, can, you can do it for like two, three days. And, and that's like full time if somebody is already looking at it. Yeah. But, but I would yeah. say that you could do a project for a year. Um, for DNA barcoding of a specific set, and that would be enough given the standards of Philippine systems of research. Yeah, and pub and publication. So would okay. that one year be? Would that include also the, the length of waiting for your your results to be published in a peer reviewed article? Oh, that would be like at the very least maybe like for manuscript submission. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know how reviewers how re the review process takes a long time so i would say you can do proposal writing you have your project done and then submission of manuscript one year one year but that's in like from where you are but not in the philippines no in the philippines one yeah. year oh. oh that's yeah. good to know <laughs> okay from uh <laughs> miss <laughs> For where I am, it should be just one month. <laughs> one month. <laughs> From Gazelle Rule, Rule, I, I I hope it pronounced it right. Hi. Um. Uh, okay. I, this is actually a, a, yeah. a comment. A comment. It's actually a comment addressed to John Raymond. So uh, the person is also working with ethnobotanical research, and um, her question is. Um, if we are going to do molecular confirmation for species endemicity, what's the best protocol that we should follow or you know base their experiment on? So as far as I know, um, UST uh, look for Dr. Cecilia Banag's uh, lab group have done a lot of work in terms of this avenues of research, um, especially with plants. So maybe you can look we can you can uh, look that up uh yeah and there's a there's a seminar series for terrestrial sampling um next week on facebook from so that's also one good avenue to, to okay uh, probably we'll just search for it and just search for it on facebook and um sign up okay so uh any more questions from our audience We'll just wait for one or two and then probably, okay, from Michelle Esuelo, uh, she's been doing DNA barcoding on moths right now as um, for her thesis. And what can you say about studying this family here in the Philippines, uh, especially those that are members of the invertebrates? What can I say about mm. moths? And right. DNA barcoding. Mm -hmm. Basically, I know DNA barcoding and I know what moths are. And good luck with your thesis. <laughs> Specifically, um, for invertebrate species, um, it's the thing with the the thing with invertebrates is that in the Philippines we have a lot of terrestrial vertebrate work, um, Philippine institutions and collaborations. But if you look outside, if you look for your moth family, specific moth family. 
you might actually um, get a lot of um, sequencing and data already from other countries, which you can use to uh, use as parallel studies. So you can just follow through along, especially with mo especially with Lepidoptera. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of studies out there. All right. So good luck, Michelle, to your thesis. Uh, we hope that you find uh, lots of relevant material for you to work on. Okay. So I think there's no... No more questions from our audience. I think we will be closing our webinar. It's already past lunch, and uh, I hope you're already eating. Despite uh, you no, know, we're having this uh, parallel um, learning event. All right. So um, the Museum of Natural History, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension here at UP Los Banos, College Laguna, Philippines, is uh, awarding the certificate of recognition to Nikki Diane Rio Lobit for serving as a resource person during this uh, uh, MNH Biodiversity Seminar on DNA Barcoding Plus, Unraveling Philippine Biodiversity Using um, Next Generation Sequencing, held today, March 17, 2021, 10.30 to 12, oh, 12.30 <laughs> noon, uh, Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. So in witness were of the signature of our director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon, is uh, here unto a fix. Okay. So congratulations, Mom Nick Dai. And uh, make sure that you have already answered our online evaluation form. I've already posted the link on the, the chat box. Uh, 